Tony, you walked to the church later? Didn't you go already today? Yeah, have confession. I gotta go back to pray for something. For what? I gotta pray for Father Frank Jr. to call me. I to call him direct. I want him to call me. A son should call his mother. Wait a minute. You going to church to have God make Frank Jr. call you? Right. You know, you're turning God into telephone operator. Reboot. Which one will it be? It's the Ruined Child Hoof Podcast. Greetings, Starfighters. Thank you for tuning in to Rune Childhoods, whether you're a subscriber or, hey, maybe you just saw a podcast, was talking about Saturday Night Fever and its gloriously terrible sequel, Staying Alive, um, or you're just, I don't know, you've listened to everything else, uh, whatever reason, we're glad you're listening. Um, my name's Dan, and with me, as always, my brother, John. How's it going, John? It's going okay, Dan. How are you? You know, I am I am doing all right. Uh, I've got, my left foot is um, swollen to about twice its usual size, thanks to a damn a flare up of the gout. I'm exaggerating a bit, but it definitely feels it elicits memories of the saw the line from "Comfortably Numb" by Pink Floyd. My hands felt like two balloons. Uh, it's just my foot, and it it feels like a balloon that's been hit with a hammer right now. Because I got the gout. You know, some people just have gout, and that's just a fact of life. You take the it, good. It happens. You, you take the gout, you take the bad. I don't know. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> so I, I am so excited that we're finally going to get a chance to record this episode, because it's been a minute. We've both been really, really busy, and yeah, things have gotten in the way. Life has just gotten in the way. But here we are. We are talking about Saturday Night Fever. But first... I wanted to mention one more thing about, can you believe the last one that we did was nine to five? That felt like it was 30 years ago. It really. Like that we recorded the episode. It really, yeah, it really, it really does, doesn't it? I mean, like, has anything changed? Has Have they made a sequel since we recorded the episode? Like, Well, there has been another uh, Jane Fonda, Lily Tomlin movie that came out <laughs> like aside from 80 for Brady there was like another one that just like came out and has already been like left theaters so it has it has okay been, it has been a while I mean um, I know I, I read even... I read an article like I read an interview with Jane Fonda where she talks about doing peyote with Lily Tomlin man well uh, was was it like a uh, flirting with disaster situation well yes and that's the funny thing is <laughs> was Alan app- Alda there? no apparently Lily Tomlin is actually like a you know like exp- like a guide she was j- like Jane Fonda's Ooh. guide and apparent I mean I, there was no mention of flirting with disaster but all I was thinking was I was like wait a second I'm like how much of that did she throw in there in and, that movie and you know whatever yeah, right. I mean it's brilliant <laughs> And and by the way, the movie was called Moving On that uh, the two of them were in together that just kind of like. Sounds like pan. audience moved on from that one. Oh boy. oh, boy. But I did have another thing that I wanted to because I was thinking about it a little bit more and I was thinking about some, uh, you know, present day actresses who I feel would like if there was going to be more of like a straight remake done of it than, you know, some of the people that I'd love to see. And this of course would be like a, a less goofy version because nine to five, the original, the only, uh, well not really the only because of the television adaptations and stage adaptations, but John, I know where you're going with this, where a reunion of the hours stars, Meryl Streep, Nicole Kidman and Julianne Moore in I'm a, sorry, in no. a very strong, straight serious remake of nine to five also directed by Stephen Daldry. <laughs> okay. No, I was thinking, no. uh, some, some maybe of a, of a different generation. Uh, I was thinking Florence Pugh, who's always great. Yes. Tessa Thompson, who's always great. And to round it out, I was thinking Dakota Johnson. I really like a lot of the stuff that I've seen her in. I feel like, you know, she really came onto the scene with, uh, 50 shades of gray 
And uh, I feel like that's how I first became aware of her. And then uh, movies like Peanut Butter Falcon, you know, she's she's actually good. And I don't know that I've ever seen any anything that she's done. Oh, really? I I think that she's really great. And she's uh, I just think of her as like, you know, the uh, the offspring of Don Johnson and Melanie Griffith. She is that, but she's more granddaughter than that. of Tippy Hedron. Yeah, she's not just a nepo baby. Who? She speaking is... of, I was just watching in Marnie uh, because I'm more of a fan. I, I've discovered that I enjoy Hitchcock's kind of like lesser, I don't know, acclaimed films more than like the big ones. But yeah, sorry, that was a tangent. Well, I have a news bit that's not so new anymore because I took a note of this when it was new news and now it's probably who knows if these this is even still a thing but speaking of hitchcock uh did you hear about oh. the plans that paramount has to uh to remake vertigo i i do believe that uh crossed my radar at some point um r- remind me refresh me on the details please uh all all i know is that there were they pr- Paramount has preemptively acquired the rights to remake Vertigo, and the person who is in talks to star is Robert Downey Jr. I have no qualms with that. Okay. And do I we could, know, like, who's directing? I No, this is, like, just early chit-chat. They've, okay. they've acquired the rights. That's all. I would, I, I would, I am interested to know more. Um, you know what? And- maybe maybe more news has come up since then, and I will see if I can do a, a quick Google to find out. I mean, perhaps. So anyway, coming back to Dakota Johnson. So it looks like she was also in Don't Worry Darling, which I saw, and The Social Network, which I saw. She was like hardly in The Social Network. I think that she's like, oh. I think that she's just the woman who sleeps with like Sean Parker Right. And is in like a scene. And She's in 21 uh, Jump Street. I it, saw that. You know, very, very small role. She's just like one of the other. So I, but I, cops. so I have seen her in things just not. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Here's, here we go on movie web. And this is as of two days ago. Alfred Scott Classic is slated to be remade of Robert Downey Jr. as the lead. Here's everything we know. I'm just quickly scanning this to see if there's anything about. Uh, a director um but i think that it's really just kind of talking more about the original they're talking a little bit about robert downey jr and it's like you know before he was iron man he was actually some pretty interesting stuff and it's like <laughs> oh my god uh how <laughs> yeah, short our memories can be he was nominated for an academy award the same year of iron man i'm pretty sure tropic thunder Okay, so uh, writer Stephen Knight is committed to the project. Are you? Do we know Stephen Knight? I'm I looking him up really quick. Don't know. Does not Stephen Knight, about. writer from uh, Locke, Serenity, Dirty Pretty Things, Eastern Promises. Okay, Peaky Blinders. But Dirty Pretty Things is a good movie. I remember that. Okay, so The Girl in the Spider's Web. Okay, all right. Pawn Sacrifice with Tobey okay. Maguire. Tobey Maguire chess movie. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, I think that that's all the information that there is really. Like, that's it, the writer. Okay, so a, de- a developing story to be followed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I also wanted to mention, because this is something that we had talked about before, uh, I don't remember what episode it was on, but we had mentioned how there was a True Lies series yes. that's on Paramount Plus, maybe? Was this just, I believe this might have just been a text. <laughs> oh, maybe we just texted about it. I, but, I think uh, I just texted you because, I yeah, it's on Paramount Plus. And, I like, watched I, a few episodes. Yeah. And uh, have you seen any of it? No, all I know is from the from like from the description of the series, it sounds much very much like what a sequel would have been had it been made. Okay, with things um, picking up and Helen kind of joining Harry. Yeah, I mean that happens like pretty much right away. It's not very. Is it's it kind fine. of just like it's, a husband and wife spy 
series. Yeah, it's Mick G. So if you know the Mick G vibe, you know exactly what it's like. No, okay, that no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So and and although I will say the um the main character in it is played by his name's yeah Steve Howie who's in Shameless. He's been in a bunch of stuff. Before. He was in Reba, um, and he's I. When I watched Shameless, I was like, oh, I really like this guy. He's really fun. Ah. And so he is the Arnold Schwarzenegger character, which, you know, it, it's fine. It's fine. But no, it's Mick G. It, it's, no, it's really funny and interesting and just kind of like a weird coincidence is that earlier today, Mick G's name came up just in my mind because I was like, you know, just kind of scrolling through selections, streaming on Prime, and I saw Terminator Genesis, which I'm like, I'm pretty sure I watched that, though I don't have a, a clear memory of it. Did and McG then I do thought, that? well, that was no. exactly what I was thinking. And I was like, no, McG did Terminator Salvation. Right. And by the way, I will say this I did enjoy McG's Charlie's Angels. Right. When I uh, for anybody it. who is not familiar with McG, you know the the aughts Charlie's Angels uh, was McG. Also, the television show Chuck, which I was an extra on an episode. Oh, briefly. It was. Uh, it was. Back, there, it was that, that was, time. That was that. It was that era. It was that uh, era. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, oh, he, oh, McG yeah. also did. I, I didn't. He also do Mister and Mrs. Smith. The Brad Pitt Angelina did, Jolie. Well, I know. That doesn't feel like. Or a no, McG that was movie. Doug Lyman. Never forget yeah, that's it. Doug it, Lyman. That was Doug Lyman. Forget I even suggested it was McG. Anyway, so any, Charlie's Angels full throttle. Yes, I yeah I saw both of the, the Charlie's t- Angels movies in the theater. Oh, did you really? Yes, I I really enjoyed the first one. The second one, uh, I was just kind of like a out of circumstance, like kind of you know somewhere for a weekend, and just being like, oh, all right, let's go see whatever movie. So. Playing. Okay, so McG also did the Turner and Hooch reboot series, a remake series, the Lethal Weapon reboot series. Oh, like, okay. It's just kind of his So this thing. is what McG does. He did the movie This Means War, uh, that one with Chris Pine oh, the, and Tom Hardy. And Reese Witherspoon. And Reese Witherspoon. Did We Are Marshall. I guess he did some Offspring music videos. I bet he did. A Gap commercial for khakis. I remember he came from the the, music video world. Yeah, Bare Naked Ladies, One Week. Okay. Everclear, Corn, Smash Mouth. Yeah, okay. That that all sublime. All makes perfect sense. The timing works out. Yeah. So McGee strikes again with a cliche TV knockoff of a um, big budget motion picture that never received its rightfully deserved sequel. And we will discuss that on another episode. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Oh, I know so. (laughs) Uh, So, I mean, we're already almost 15 minutes into this episode uh, and we're just kind of blabbing, blabbing on. Have you seen it? It's been a while. Have you you seen any movies lately or you've been kind of busy? I have been so busy. Uh, For those who don't know, I, I am a high school teacher and I also direct high school theater where I teach and recently directed the first musical I've directed in almost 20 years. Um, I mostly do the, have done the non-musicals and this year um, was, was handed the reins of the spring musical and uh, said I'm doing Little Shop of Horrors. This is, this is, you know, it's one of my favorite films. It's a show I I was in, in college. And I, you know, I was like, I know this and I'm like, I think I can do this. And I, I, you know, we'll, that's an, it's another one that we'll talk about another time. Cause we'll, you know, if we ever do a little job of horrors episode, it'll be much more relevant to talk about. Sure. I the hope whole process. Did. But anyway, it was quite a process and it was an ordeal and the show was fantastic. We got a nice little uh, mention on our uh, local Seattle NPR station, KUOW. And cool. uh, yeah, the, the, the uh, arts art, arts correspondent um, uh, for KUOW came out to the show and 
gave us a little, you know, featured us on his like, you know, hey, here's three things going on around town that you should go check out. The so, the NPR affiliate bump is a real thing. I, I mean, I I was experienced like, it. He people listen to that when when I've been when I've done things where either I'm on a like here it's OPB Oregon Public Broadcasting. So right. if the, like you find out who you know that listens to the NPR affiliate. They come out of the woodwork. You start getting texts being like, oh, I haven't talked to this person in a long time. And there's like, I heard you on NPR or whatever. Well, yeah, no, I bet that that makes sense considering your your line of work and the organizations uh, that you work for in Portland. Yeah. So I, I'm sure that you also got a lot of people being like, oh, my God, I heard about the thing. And da, 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 da. we were sold out for our closing closing night there performance. The principal got the principal got like the last available seat. <laughs> it was funny and yeah anyway so been really busy have i watched any movies recently um i i want to say yes because as i said before i was watching marnie so this week i'm on spring break and um you know just kind of like you know doing some stuff around the house and i you know have a movie on and watched yeah. a couple in preparation for our coming episodes so yeah. there's those movies so I'll more on that later but we um, got a few really good ones coming up was watching Marnie this very like fascinating Alfred Hitchcock movie that like so many of his other like I don't know kind of like second tier films to me really resonates and it's like, Oh wow. There's so much about this that feels so current and relevant and impactful. Whereas I, I felt like some of his higher profile movies have not resonated as, as clearly um, or as, as strongly. I've never, with me. I've never seen Marnie. No, I mean, it is, it's on Netflix. Netflix just added a, you know, a, a handful of, of Hitchcocks, you know, Psycho, The Birds, which I was not, that, that to me was like. We talked you, about The Birds recently. Yeah, if you saw it at the time, I'm sure it was terrifying and you watch it now, you watch, you sit there thinking like, oh, well, if I'd seen it back at the time, right. it would have been terrifying. Anyway, speaking of having seen it at the time, I was born just a few years, a few years, a few months late. Um, or no, sorry. Actually, th when did when did Saturday Night Fever come out? Saturday Night Fever was released on December sixteenth, nineteen seventy seven. So I was um I, I I was alive. <laughs> I was not old enough to see. You were staying alive. I was at that I point. Was, staying alive was pretty much my one goal at yeah. that at that moment. I I was not yet even wearing boogie shoes. Eat, sleep, poop, and stay alive. That's pretty much all I was doing because I was like a month old. So anyhow, Saturday night. But <laughs> even if I was older, I don't I don't know that I'm currently old enough to watch Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> Saturday Night Fever is a real bait and switch situation of a movie. <laughs> Oh shit! It is the. Mo I mean, I you're gonna you you'll do the synopsis, but I let me just say, like, candidate for the most mismarketed movie ever. Well, and, and to this day, to this day, you know, when you to think Saturday day. Night Fever, when anybody mentions it, you think about you know the white suit, the disco dancing, the you know. Even at its basics, the walking down the street with the paint can, like, well, or just like the dinner with the family with my hair, my hair, I work hard on my hair, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And then he goes and, and hits it. Sure, and I'm I not mean, even trying to do a good Travolta, but of, by the way. but of course, you know, at the time you have Vinny Barbarino in a movie, like that's it, right? And, and he's disco dancing, like that's what it is. And boy, oh boy, shall I, shall I get into it? Yeah, but it, it, I, before you do, it's just imagine you, it's Vinny Barbarino, and that's all you know, and that's all you think, and you're like, oh, well, he's so funny, hey, and welcome up back, your Connor. Nose with the rubber hose, and 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 it it must have been akin to I know, like Eddie Murphy talks about uh, in Delirious when when he's like, all of you who brought kids down thinking I was going to be up here with the buckwheat wig on, you're yeah, in right. for a surprise. I'm paraphrasing; yeah. he says it much differently, yeah. but anyway, that is. 
man. All right. Give the synopsis and then we'll talk about just how crazy this movie is. Okay, here we go. In a particular Brooklyn dance club, the floor clears when 19-year-old Tony Monero begins to dance. His style, swagger, confidence, and talent are leagues beyond his peers. In the heteronormative world in which Tony exists, the women want him and the men want to be him. But his celebrity begins and ends in the club. Sure, he does a great job at the paint store where he works. But at home, Tony is a speck of dust compared to his older brother, Frank Jr., the Catholic priest. Despite his best efforts to impress his ultra-conservative parents, Tony is left picking up the scraps of their approval wherever he can find them. And Tony's friends aren't too great either. They have serious beef with a Hispanic gang called the Barracudas, and they also make womanizing and sexual assault part of their normal routine. But the gray clouds part when Tony meets Stephanie, an ultra-talented dancer that he sees as his ticket out of the life he's stuck in. Tony manages to convince Stephanie to dance with him in a competition, and together, they find friendship. Yes, elements of Tony's life creep into his relationship with Stephanie, nearly ruining the one positive element in his life. And for Stephanie, she finds a release in Tony, someone she can finally see as an admirer of who she is as a person and not just as a toy to be used. So that's my synopsis of Saturday Night Fever. Uh, it's really hard to to really explain the uh, some of the complexities that go to it. I didn't even go into the you know the dynamics between him and his friends and the 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 one friend he has who's kind of like the dud of the group who uh, ends up impregnating a girl and well uh, and ultimately you know jumping off of a bridge. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think we're we're out out of spoiler uh, territory oh, yeah. here. Yeah. Well, I mean, even, look, even if we're spoiling it, it's so unbelievable in the way that things kind of pan out in this movie that it's it's I feel like only appropriate to talk about it. So, John, when was the first time you saw this movie? In its entirety, probably about a month or so ago. But okay. I have definitely put it on and then probably turned it off five times. Like, you know, thinking like, oh, yeah, I'll this time I'll watch it and, it, you know, and, and I'll get through it. But then it's just like, oh, my God. But I, I appreciated the opportunity that knowing that we were going to be talking about it to actually sit down and like watch it, watch it. Yeah, it, it it's a very uncomfortable movie extremely uncomfortable you know it's funny because you th- you think about this movie and it's it's funny to me that paramount so that gr- like greece comes out a year later and it's this yeah. huge hit so paramount cuts a pg rated version of this movie right. i'm like what is it the dance scenes and like the scenes at his at his house and it, like because not even all the scenes at his house like that stuff gets pretty intense yeah, I mean, yeah. but I mean, I mean, just you know, like what, like the stuff with Frank Jr., which is kind of like so shoehorned in that it makes me wonder how much of that story was cut out and like right. what and what. I mean, I I think he's gay, and you that Frank Jr. is gay. Yeah, yeah. Because well, I, th- uh, yeah, what? I no, I could see that. I I didn't necessarily you know watch it with that in mind, but sure. I mean, I it, I think the the like you know kind of the whole the whole story with him is that he just kind of ends up moving into this, or I, that it might be in the you know quote unquote true story that this is based on. Oh right, um, right, right. Uh, um, which I am opening. I have open inside the tribal rights of the new Saturday Night, which was published in New York Magazine in 1976, mm. and um, oh. I. I read through it and I mean, of course it it had had since come out that this was pure fiction though. It might be one of those that like I compare to James phrase, a million little pieces where it's kind of like, okay, if a lot, if this is mostly exaggerated and there's elements of this that are made up like, okay, but like, you read a million little pieces and you're like, I don't want to go through what he went through. Like I am staying the Uh hell away from like whatever meth or whatever the hell else he was on. Yeah. And I feel like with, with this and I, I don't know 
but it seems like this is a pretty like gritty realistic portrayal of like you call them heteronormative uh group of of friends well uh, i mean i i I just used uh that word because it made sense then to use the women want him and the men want to be him well but yeah uh, yeah, but also it's very much like you know we are talking about an italian community in the late 70s which you know also uh a territory and this theme was explored a little bit more in it uh you know spike lee's summer of sam yeah which definitely borrows a lot of like the disc, like John Leguizamo definitely wears like a knockoff Saturday Night Fever suit in it. But it feels like there's there's those like gender roles, there's expectations, and those come out so strongly in these characters. And you feel in the discos this sense of like, like rape, like this is not a glorified place it like it really looks like these shady like you know it's it's these dimly lit discos and they have like the light up floor yeah. um in this place and it's pretty and, and like 2001 odyssey space odyssey right it was actual disco in bay ridge but it's not it's not glamorous you don't get the feeling that like oh, they're filming imagine on- that place in the daytime with the lights on the overhead lights it's disgust it's got to be disgusting exactly i know yeah. and it feels so real and so much of it felt so real honestly i'm sitting there and i'm watching and i'm like i'm not watching this feeling like i'm watching like like grease with disco music i feel like i'm watching requiem for a dream yeah yeah it's really dark it's really really freaky and that's <laughs> the, even the, before like, the, the whole the 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 you know, gang rape of, of, oh. um, Annette Donna Pescow. Yeah. Um, who's just like heartbreaking in this. And you feel, you're like, oh God. And as she's it, it, this movie, and I feel so mixed about this movie, ah, because it gives you these m- moments that are so effective. And as you're watching her, as she's popping pills and drinking at the club, yeah. and you see her interacting with the other guys, and you're just like, oh my God. And maybe it was because I I had seen this movie once before, maybe in high school, oh, wow. like on VHS. And I I watched the whole thing, but honestly, what stuck with me was that was mostly the the like the rape of Annette. Yeah, and yeah, also the I attempted mean, the attempted rape of um, uh, uh, Stephanie. Stephanie, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with Annette, it's really troubling. You know, she is this character who, you know, she adores Tony. And it's just like, in order for her to be close to him, she has to, you know, she just wants to be in that orbit no matter what. And just like accepts all of this awful stuff that's happening to her just to kind of be in the orbit of this mediocre dude. And like, he won't sleep with her yeah she's like fine i'm gonna show him and she's you know letting you know all of his friends yeah, yeah. i mean she, but she doesn't and like she does is, you know she, no she's not, not letting them because yeah. she says she does say no she does yeah like she yes she gets into that but like you know uh, it, 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 no means no at any point so right. and although uh, i that although is not in any way to uh, no, 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 know, no, no. Go no, against no. what you were just saying. No. Uh, but I, I wanted to uh, just kind of go back be- because I, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on the way that in my synopsis, I interpreted the the character of Tony and his and the way that he is perceiving his group of friends and the world that he's in uh, as they are kind of going against the person who he kind of really wants to be. But the way that these powers are kind of holding him in place, I, I don't know. I, I'm just curious to know what you what you think about that. Do you agree with that? Uh, do you see him as somebody who is happy with the way that his life is and his group of friends are? Um, no. I mean, okay. I agree. No, I mean, he is not. 
It's a complicated question. And again, the 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 fact that it's a complicated question does make me say like, all right, this movie is worthy of of that recognition and like, you know, it was an Academy Award nominee, John Travolta. Yeah. And this is where I'm like, man, like this movie does present some really complicated questions because it's kind of like if he could be if he could freeze the moment in time when he's dancing, not in competition. Yeah. Not in competition, but when he's just dancing, when he's out there and he is, you know, in the in the um inside the tribal rights of the new Saturday night, like, you know, the face. He's a face and everyone is is watching him and I feel like if Tony could f- could live in that moment in time just on repeat for the rest of his life, he would. I think the fact right. that he can't is is what drives him crazy. The end of it when he's, you know, when when he when he kind of feels like, all right, he's going off towards his future. He's yeah. going to get to get out of this place. And it but to me it feels very much like the end of the graduate. Sure. Where it's okay. like you're 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 you know you're where you're headed away from, but you don't know where you're headed to. Okay, so the 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 movie takes place, you know, it's in I like it's in Brooklyn, Brooklyn at the time. This is not cool Brooklyn. This is very much like very seedy New York. If it wasn't Manhattan, it was whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. but also in the club and there may have been some moments where where maybe this wasn't exactly the way I'm about to describe it, but of his friend of his friends he's the only like his friends just sit at the table and drink and you know and hook up with girls or whatever he's the, going out he's there to dance you know he is there because that is where he gets to be himself he he just really wants to be a performer he that's what he strives to be that's why you know he's going against his parents wishes because he really wants this is his calling and stephanie and the character of Stephanie is really fascinating. You know, he he becomes uh, connected with her because he sees her dancing and she's amazing. And he's just like, ooh, if I link up with this one, then uh, certainly, you know, we're each other's kind of ticket to greatness, essentially. And she is somebody who has, is kind of like, as he can see it, the next level up. Uh, right. she, she talks a lot about the, she name drops like crazy, the people who she's, who are in her orbit. Not that it's necessarily accurate to the, to the reality of the situation, but it's kind of like, she's saying like, oh, these people like are looking up to me. I gotta, you know, play up to this character that they think I am. And right. uh, she, well, she happens, works in Manhattan. She works she in Manhattan. She li- cross over. Yeah, and she and she lives in this this place out there and uh for Tony it's you know it's the north star it's the way to get it's the way to get there and um when we see the reality of her situation and then based on that the way that Tony then kind of responds to her and kind of reverts to his you know other this other part of him and this other part of his life, it's really mind blowing. And I thought that it was a really, a really creative way to tell, to tell the story. And uh, I mean, it directed by John Badham, a uh, short circuit war games yes. <laughs> uh, and writ- yes, stake out uh, written by Norman Wexler, who wrote Serpico, who, um, uh, one of you know you know i love it when there's a reference to like a recent movie uh in a movie so on um on his like bedroom wall he has like a rocky poster and a serpico yeah. poster yeah uh, a rocky poster being especially interesting considering that sylvester stallone directs the sequel <laughs> Well, and that John G. Avildsen was supposed to was originally going to direct this. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I feel like it would have been a much different movie, though. And I feel like it, it, whatever John Badham, uh, like brought to it, I, I feel like ultimately it makes it a a better movie. I feel like with John G. Avildsen, 
uh, there would have been more of a focus on like the competition. Just, I mean, right. I, I guess, well, me, I mean, if I, you're thinking the Rocky pathway, well, I'm thinking Rocky, I'm thinking karate kid. Um, yeah. I mean, there's two movies where, well, I mean, those two movies, uh, <laughs> you know, these these competition movies where the winning is uh, de- debatable. You know, in Rocky, right. it's it's more of a a personal victory rather than a technical victory, and in Karate Kid, you know, it's a very no. I mean, he the, Johnny sweeps the leg and like he Daniel sweeps comes, the leg and he yeah, of course, but Daniel and, I don't does know. the crane kick and no, 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 that's a totally clean win. Like it's a that, clean win. It's that, a clean that's win. A, no, that's that is true. a that is a clean win. Um, and he, I, I don't believe he did any of the sequels. So anyway, <laughs> that's who was originally supposed to direct it. And then for staying alive, Travolta had much more of a say in who was going to be making the film. And he wanted. I I remember reading that the same energy because Stallone directed Rocky three. I think that was where. I don't think Stallone directed two. I think he he directed uh, started by directing three, and okay. I think it was like that was like Travolta was like I like want that energy, which is what brings Stallone. He wanted the sweat, right? Right, which is <laughs> which is really uh, what you get in Staying Alive. <laughs> That's... Well, shall I synopsize Staying Alive? Go right ahead. Five years after Tony and Stephanie's performance, he's, I'll, I'll stop with that voice. It's going to get old for me really fast. Five years after Tony and Stephanie's performance, he's living on his own in Manhattan and struggling to make ends meet as he tirelessly tries to impress talent agents and choreographers in his quest to be a professional performer. Currently, in a friends with benefits situation with fellow dancer Jackie, they hit the audition scene together, performing dance moves that can only be replicated after mixing espresso with cocaine. But after seeing a posh dancer named Laura, Tony is driven to hitch his star to her wagon in a quest for success, which results in a bit part in a Broadway show called Satan's Alley. But deep into rehearsals, the male lead isn't cutting it, and Tony manages to sneak his way into the role, finally winning the pride of his conservative mother. Tony's relationships with both Jackie and Laura become more complicated, which nearly makes him lose sight of his ultimate goal to be a successful performer. It's... I freaking loved staying alive. It was so much fun. It was completely ludicrous. I enjoyed myself watching it. If Saturday Night Fever is like the hard liquor, staying alive is the Miller High Life chaser. Like <laughs> it is the, uh, you know, it is the perfect This week, way let's call it to... a Bud Light. Yes, absolutely. It's it's absolutely It is definitely ridiculous. A, Bud Light it yeah. is, and, and it is, and not to it, all due respect to Bud Light, it is definitely, it, it, I mean, and Saturday Night Fever just being like, I don't know, Fireball Whiskey, I, I don't know, then this is definitely the Bud Light. And so, uh, by the way, Dan, uh, Stallone did direct Rockies 2 and 3 and 4 and Balboa. Didn't he direct Rocky Five? Uh, I do not see Rocky Five on his directorial list. <laughs> he he took his name off of it. <laughs> I see Paradise Alley, Rocky Two, II, Rocky Three, Staying Alive, Rocky Four, Rocky Balboa. So a a gap from uh, 1985 to 2006 of directing. Rocky Balboa is quality entry into the franchise. I don't really remember that one. That um, was a I I I believe that was a Christmas day with mom and dad. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um he also did Rambo and then The Expendables. Yeah. And then uh I see some upcoming when, when, projects. When he IMDb. came back with that Rambo the fourth Rambo, it was it was basically just like, okay, I'm going to direct these movies like it's still the 80s, but I can get away with a lot more. And that oh, yeah. was that fourth Rambo movie had moments that, and I know I'm digressing here slightly, but that fourth Rambo movie had moments that I remember watching it in my apartment in Union City, and with our former guest Cesar Gracia, and oh, yeah. um, moments where we would Scarface. pause it and we would go back and be like, "Wait a second, did that actually just happen?" 
and it was bad shit. And then the, seeing the Expendables, uh, that completely uh, bananas movies. I mean, that's just the the world that Sylvester Stallone lives in directorially. Uh, I guess so. He has an a, an amazing cameo in Staying Alive as himself presumably yeah yeah <laughs> or just yeah. like an ostentatiously dressed you know guy on the new york streets that uh tony bumps into wearing like a uh, i don't know some sort of like fur shawl yeah <laughs> it's he's so kinda, weird like he's kind of pimped out yeah he's got this like weird uh you know animal skin situation going on and just bumps into yeah. him on the street so um, anyway yeah so staying alive is like it's absolutely it's the it, it's Basically just a dance movie. The opening. Se- oh, it's, it's so much fun. The opening sequence where uh, they're at, you know, it's just like a, a dance audition for something. And Kurtwood Smith is yes. the choreographer. Just like I, I I don't remember if he was smoking a cigarette, but he may as well yes. have been. Yes. He was, I, you know, absolutely. And, and it's so funny to see Kurtwood Smith. I mean, I don't even leave. remember him having having any lines, but he just aside from the cocaine that was probably uh, you know <laughs> backstage. But uh, he was just like I was just like, oh damn, it's Kurtwood Smith, yes. And it's so disappointing <laughs> that he's not in in the rest of it. I know. I was so wishing that he would be, um, but although you know, I per- have to say that the director of this this Broadway show uh, that I, I'm like. What is going on in this brought like what it's is like a, happening? Like a Xanadu kind of a but like some you know, like, just... like but or like Dante's Inferno, but oh with, yeah, like yeah. inter like interpretive like quasi erotic dance and there's a lot of skin and sweat and muscles. It's, but the director, uh, yeah. I I love like the director of it. Oh God, who is it? He kind of I feel like he reminded me of William Atherton. Uh, oh, he totally has William Atherton qualities. Um, he's got bless his William heart. Atherton eyes. <laughs> I usually uh, sing that whenever I hear that song, Betty Davis eyes. I usually sing it as Gina Davis eyes. Oh yeah. So what's also fascinating about there's a lot of things fascinating about staying alive, but for it to be called a variation on. The song that was in Saturday Night Fever. It's not staying alive. It's staying alive. Yes. Uh, so, but also it's like, I don't even remember. I, if, if, I know that the Bee Gees were included in it, but it's like sparsely. And it is not a disco movie. It no. is just like, I don't even know what genre you would call this music. Um, but it was very specific Early to the 80s broadway dance because doesn't it, it, it doesn't have that like dun, 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 dun. yes the one that they use in like the saturday night live like i think the synchronized swimming sketch dun, 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 dun. yeah yeah steve inwood that's the guy who plays the director but he definitely totally. has like the beard and yeah. like the william atherton slash like i don't know hart bachner hairdo um, oh yeah oh just and, the, the and moose we we do revisit uh, the old neighborhood and got to give a shout out to Mrs. Monero, Julie Bavasso, yeah. who also, John, I know you recognized her as the mother of Todd Wilkinson, a.k.a. Vincent Antonelli in My Blue Heaven. Oh, yeah, of course. Yes. She's wonderful. I mean, she's, you know, Italian mother, whatever. Yes. I, uh, I do want to circle back to Saturday Night Fever. Uh, because in the, the first scene where they're at the like dinner table and they reference Frank Jr., the, the priest brother, and they kind of like just have a portrait of him hanging above the dinner table. And he, you know, he's got his, uh, you know, his, his priest gear on. I don't know what you call I, a nun wears a habit. Thank you, sister act. That's why I know that. I don't know what a priest wears. The collar situation, the frock. frock. Yeah. Yeah. And uh Dan, I gotta tell you, I was like, is that Father Karras? Do they have a picture of Father Karras on the wall? <laughs> he looks just like Karras, the exorcist. <laughs> oh my god, that would be that would have been so great if it was just like if it was just straight up like Jason Miller as yeah. Father Damien Karras. <laughs> and it was just like your brother Damn, and he's doing this work in Washington, me? DC. Yeah. And I just, you know, he's out there doing good. And then meanwhile, he's 
you know, may the power of Christ compel you. <laughs> you go out dancing while Frank Jr. takes the takes a demon into his body and yeah. throws himself through. <laughs> Why can't you be more like Frank Jr.? <laughs> I mean Pazuzu. Uh, yeah. I mean Frank Jr. Anyway, I I I took that note. I had to I had to mention that. No, um, that's great. But yeah, Father Karras, uh, they, they they just look so much like each other. I don't know if that's just me and you know my vision of you know an, an Italian male of that age range in the seventies. Like I mean, you know, they they truly had the same vibe going on. Yeah. So, um, oh, and you know what? Also, got a point. Uh, so, Cynthia Rhodes, who's mm-hmm. in it, who, um, who plays Jackie, who's like his, uh, his. It's very know. vague the way that they show it because it's not his girlfriend, but they're kind of just like a. They're buds. It's like they're yeah, they're they're friends with benefits. It's, there's a little like, will they or won't they? But she was Penny in Dirty Dancing. Oh. Right. Yes. Yes. So if you yeah. know her from somewhere, and she was all um was f- formerly uh, also like I did not know this until just now when I looked it up, but married to Richard Marx. I did look that up. I did remember seeing that. Speaking about hair, Dude, that's some hair. Richard Marx has had fabulous hair. Still has fabulous. Still hair. has still has great hair. Took great care of it. So Dan, I want to tell you now that we've talked about. These two movies, I want to tell you about what I would do to bring this back, if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. What would you do? Yeah, go. <laughs> so I'm thinking it's time. We need to round out a trilogy. We have to bring it all together. So now Tony is old. He's out of shape. Still struggling to get by. Let's just say Devil's Alley didn't really, you know make him the way that uh, he he was expecting it. But there's like an old eight millimeter film that gets discovered from him dancing at 2001 Odyssey in like Andy Warhol's archives. Because you know that Warhol was like going over there, like had people over there. And so uh, they, they digitize Warhol's like archives and it goes online. And this video of Tony goes viral and it creates this like huge disco resurgence like okay like the 1997 swing um like the, exactly like this the swing nice. revival of the 90s uh no, 1997 it, i think it, it was, was only 97 well so, 90s, i guess 96 too yeah. it's when swingers came out go for it right 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 so i uh, i know that if we start like really getting into like you know, the life and death of disco and all that stuff. We could be talking for hours and everything and, you know, probably getting a lot of information wrong, but disco came really came to a a close due to racism and homophobia. And like, you know, has kind of, uh, has never really had, there's definitely disco influence in a lot of music that, that comes out now. But I think that anything that gets like labeled as disco isn't necessarily straight up disco. It's more of just like with disco flair and things you like that. You mean like new music or? Yeah, I mean new music. Oh, okay. Yeah, like disco beats that get incorporated or samples from disco that, that come up now. Yeah. Because you're not, you know, you, def, you don't have anything that's really like ABBA or Bee Gees. That's. No, other than you know, like new music. The- new ABBA album which is a thing right newish I guess but (laughs) disco is very specific to a certain time yes Uh, my my kids school is having a fundraiser that's a disco and all of the imagery is Saturday Night Fever and you know it's true but I mean yeah I mean what else would you use to aside from like a disco ball one of the, like the key things that people associate with disco is the white suit and the yeah. you know pointing up and the everything like that. By the way, so, do you know who bought that white suit? Tell me. Gene Siskel. This was Gene Siskel's favorite movie. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Roger Ebert, I think after Siskel's death, Rob, Roger Ebert wrote like a really nice like review of Saturday Night Fever slash like tribute to Gene Siskel's yeah. love of it. But anyway, so Dan, you were saying. So 
here's what I find really interesting. In the world, in our world, we associate disco music and we collectively as a society associate disco music with the visuals of Saturday Night Fever. However, in the world of Saturday Night Fever, the movie Saturday Night Fever does not exist. True. So in 2023, Tony Manero's, you know, universe, let's assume that disco, you know, went away the same way that it, that it did in reality, but there's not the same visual representation. So when people see a like a found, you know, reel with Tony dancing, it's new to them. And this like iconic dancing is then a new iconic visual for them. And uh, it just like takes the world by storm and there's a new disco resurgence. Tony is the face of it and finally has a way to come back into it. However, he's impossible to track down. Nobody can find him. So it's a movie about finding Tony Monero. Okay. That's got that and as you're talking about it, and of course my I'm I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking about your idea. And that's that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh no, this has got but but I was like, you have to build up because if you're gonna have John Travolta as Tony Monero for the first time in 40 years, I mean yeah. I like assuming this hypothetical sequel gets made like this year. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, you build up to that and like, but yeah, I love the idea of like these disco enthusiasts in this, would, would this take place over the course of like a few years? I don't know. I Maybe. Okay. Cause it's, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. The whole idea of a disco because it, because yeah, like, whereas swing music, like there were definitely like new bands, like the cherry pop and daddies making, right. sw- m- making new swing music, like covering yeah. old swing music, but also making new swing music. And you're right in that, like, whereas there's been dance music certainly since the you know the disco kind of ended and and what's interesting is this movie uh, um apparently what uh Saturday night fever the backlash in Saturday night fever is that it it commercialized disco and it like whereas disco was something that was more underground and more mm-hmm. popular among um gay community and um you know black and latino communities yeah. this made it straight and white yeah <laughs> um, yeah so, which is fun, which again, you see that in Summer of Sam. Uh, yeah. So, I think the idea of, you know, what would that revival be? And it would be interesting to, what bands, what artists you would get to kind of like, I don't know, create, create new disco music. I mean, why not? Yeah. Why not? There are plenty of bands who like I I'll hear like, you know, new music, like recent releases that sure. sound like they There's were made a lot in, of disco influence. Well, ni- no, no, no. I'm saying like like mm. other genres, like something oh, sure. that sounds yeah. like it was a like, you know, produced in 1986, like and, um, like this yeah. band Los Colonias. And I listened to their you know most recent album, and it sounds like something straight out of the mid eighties. Mm-hmm. So why couldn't you have bands? I feel like the Scissor Sisters is the group that maybe came closest to this. <laughs> Are you familiar with? You, I I am only because of you. I feel like they I knew of them, and then they kind of disappeared from the zeitgeist, with the exception of you mentioning them. Well, they were bit. that era. They were that yeah. they were the you being an extra in things time. <laughs> it was that it was that moment in in it was you working on reality shows to you mm. being an extra in things. That was the Scissor Sisters like span. No, that was pre no Scissor Sisters were kind of before 04 that. 04 to 07 cuz I think their first album came out in 04 and then their second album So sec- that was that was pre me being in being an extra in things, but reality TV. Well, yeah, I mean reality TV a little bit, like Trading Spaces. Trading Spaces. Yeah. Well, 
The f- no, because Trading Spaces was two thousand eight. My it time was line perfect is proposal. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. dinner impossible, that kind of stuff. Um, so a- another thing that I wanted to to mention is like, you know, when we think about John Travolta as an actor, okay, Saturday Night Fever was really the beginning, and he's somebody who's known for having, you know, comebacks. He had, you know, of course, like the Pulp Fiction, like mid '90s comeback, uh, which came and, after the "Look Who's Talking" late '80s, which was really less of a comeback, more of a spike, more of a spike. And then, you know, you have him doing your, you know, Face Off, and then you have him doing um, Primary Colors. But primary Colors, yeah. a civil like John Travolta, in 1998, a civil action. Like yeah. some really great performances, like great, great acting. Right. And then it was like, then 2000, Battlefield Earth comes out. And everyone's oh, yeah. like, goo. You know, we get him in Swordfish. We get him in Be Cool. Right. Um, you yeah, know, and Shorty, then though, was, was fantastic. Right. We Then we have like the Wild Hogs, Old Dogs era, which also has like hairspray in it. Right. But really, you know, after that, it's just duds and like weird. All these like, made for what is this? Like vengeance you know, movies. Like I am wrath. Yeah, <laughs> it's like all these like uh, like li- like like lower budget like Liam Neeson vengeance and movies. And let's not forget the Movie Pass produced movie Gotti. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, that was uh, that was the big. I never saw so, that. Yeah, and then you know Kinda the fanatic, uh, Paradise City. You know, I'm looking at his upcoming things: American Metal, Cash Out, where he plays a character named Mason Goddard. Uh, Goddard. Okay. Yeah. So he, yeah, he's so maybe due for one one. He's maybe due one. For, yeah. Maybe yeah. Tarantino ain't gonna save him again. And also, you know, talking about Stallone. Of course, you have your like expendables types of things, but for me, when I see Stallone being like at the top of his game, is like Creed and Creed Two. Like I didn't see, I haven't seen Creed Three yet, but uh, Oscar nominated for Creed. Yeah, he was fantastic. It was, and a great yes, of course, it's a character, character that he has, you know, uh, a very, very, very long history with, and created, and like all this other stuff. But like, uh, that's when he's actually acting, and yeah. uh, you know, he's not just there to be muscles. He's there to be, you know, the heart of the movie. And uh, you know, when you when you look at other like Stallone movies, it's just like, huh, okay, well, Sylvester Stallone doing Sylvester Stallone, but. A character like the one that I'm kind of describing, somebody who has been forgotten. Right. That could be a really good opportunity. What do you think? Well, you know, and of course, Saturday Night Fever has been adapted into a stage musical. Right. Um, I imagine some of the content has been uh, removed. Uh, I haven't done much look looking into it. Um, you know, much like you, I was thinking along the lines of a, um, so either, either a sequel and thinking uh-huh. about not necessarily rounding out the trilogy, but definitely the idea of a, a, a Travolta, like there might be the right mix of nostalgia as well as like, a, a, you know, a quality writer who would yeah. actually want, you know, who, who could actually put like a really interesting spin on it. And, you know, something like you're talking about was not, you know, I hadn't thought that specifically, but that makes sense. Uh, it makes a lot more sense than just kind of a, you know, like it's Tony Monero in his third act. Like, what is he doing? And, you know, it, it, I think the most, you know, interesting my idea was getting was where I was thinking, you know, I was like, oh, like, what if what if it all comes back to this inside the tribal rights of you know, this, uh, this article that this guy, you know, totally made up, but like, what if, then what if you made it part of the story where like, you know, he finds it and he's like, oh my God, that's right. Like, you know, this did, this happened. And, you know, like there was this, this art, or maybe like it's people saying like, you know, oh yeah, no, this article was bullshit. And he'd be like, no, it wasn't bullshit. It was about me. Uh, (laughs) 
again, I'm not trying, but um, if I was trying, it would be much worse. So I either come down there or I come down on the idea of a series, not McG, not a McG Saturday Night Fever series, but a series that maybe follows the lives of the people. So like you've got all of these people who's who live these separate lives, but then one night a week they all come together on Saturday night and they all come uh-huh. together. So I, I think it, it does kind of provide a nice framework for a series where you're you're following these people and what's going on in their in their lives and then what happens when they come together at the disco and like they're bringing that with them. So mm-hmm it's kind of like you know what's the culmination of you know this week that all of these different characters have experienced and then when they get out on the dance floor how does it come out and you know yeah. i don't know pretty standard but i also can't think of too many other series again something that would be set in in that era in the late 70s um and would feature could feature both old disco music and potentially new artists creating new music in that style for the series. You know what would be really interesting is if you had let's say the entire duration of you know how things go in Saturday Night Fever, but from the perspective of the Barracudas. And it's just them. And then, like, there's this whole thing that's going on where there's a, one of Tony's friends gets, you know, beaten yeah. by somebody. And the assumption is that it is somebody who's in the Barracudas. And then we, after they trash their, like, place and all this other stuff and beat them up and everything, mm-hmm. we find out, like, Maybe it wasn't them. I don't know. Right. You know, like, uh, you know, what is happening for them? You know, what's happening on the other side of things for these other people who are just trying to, like, live their lives? You know, they are a marginalized community and they're trying to get by in a, in a really tough world. And then they have these guys who what's also really interesting is like Italian-Americans in the. 70s were way more accepted than they were a decade or two earlier. You know, Italian Americans in like the 50s were, you know, right. uh, uh, you know, looked upon the same way as I guess the, you know, those who are, you know, in the, well, the Latin community in like the 70s. It's the whole the whole idea of, you know, this whole sense of of marginalization and the impact of marginalized communities is basically you're just like I don't want to I just don't want to be the one on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, and it creates this and now it's so it's like when like you said in the 1950s, you know, Italian Americans um would have been, you know, spit at and had slurs directed sure. at them yeah. the same way that they're doing it towards the Latinos. They're kind of like they're playing into the hierarchy and it, it, of yeah. course this conversation is influenced i just finished reading the book cast by isabel wilkerson which mm-hmm. is pretty much all about the sense of like how uh, you know the, the the hierarchy in america and yeah how it, the caste system in in america so um uh, of course this has all been bopping around my brain <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 no. But it's a, it's really, it's a, it's a great time to kind of talk about that kind of thing because, you know, Saturday Night Fever. When and and it's hard to say how much John Badham kind of envisioned this at the time, or um, was it Norman Wexler was the writer, and how how much they really considered this. But you know, like Tony's parents, you know, there's this intergenerational trauma that's coming through from you know where. Tony's parents, they don't necessarily say it, but it's like they had to really struggle. And then one of their kids just wants to be a dancer. Like how insulting is that to them? You know, they've sacrificed so much and they've dealt with, you know, they've certainly dealt with a lot of hate. And then for one of their kids to be going 
into this uh into this world that's so you know could be seen as just kind of careless and and fun <laughs> uh-huh. you know and, and just not serious then you know how insulting would that be anyway that's not that's not the podcast that people maybe thought that they were going to be listening to no 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 it. uh <laughs> Hey, it's all right. We can get serious. Um, speaking if you want of, me to get silly, I've got silly. Oh, no. Well, we, yeah, no. Oh, we've got a whole episode of silly coming up. Um, I, I did want to. No, no, no. I mean, I mean oh. in this episode. I've oh, got, in this I've episode. Got, yeah. Oh, you've got some silly. Well, Dan, what if I told you that there's also some potential Saturday Night Fever resurgence in the form of either a boat or a horse? Oh, oh, wow. That's right. We're going to play my favorite game. Boat name or horse name? Is it a boat name or... Okay, okay. No, no, no. It's not is there because, of course, there are. So I ask you, according to the Registry of Horse Names and the U.S. Government Registry of Boat Names, are there more horses named Saturday Night Fever or more boats named Saturday Night Fever? I feel like this is obvious, so maybe I shouldn't go with it, but I'm going to say boats. Dan, you are wrong. It is horses. I had a feeling. There are, there are three vessels with the name Saturday Night Fever going back to 1992. Is the, no, no, 1990 is the earliest one, which is, is surprising. I thought there'd be yeah. some ones earlier. Yeah. There are eight horses by the name Saturday Night Fever dating back to 1988. We have uh, Saturday Night Fever, a quarter horse, a female, who is the spawn of Mr. Conclusion and Miss Ray Bonanza. And uh, what a what an incredible legacy. Wow. I just don't <laughs> understand this world sometimes. Oh, Dan, we are not here to understand it. We are just here to accept it and enjoy it. And uh, just so you know, we do have some... Uh, uh, boat names that go there were no horses but we have some boat names uh, that are called Staying Alive we have uh-huh. uh, one from 2000 and then Staying Alive 2 from 2003 oh no I'm sorry we have three horses named Staying Alive which is very ambitious for a horse and uh, the earliest one there is also 1988 uh, who is the spawn of Master Driver and Streaking a, a, oh, okay. a horse named Streaking. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I couldn't find any that are called Stay In Alive. Right. Okay. Nothing called Stay In Alive. Okay. Any any like horses named like Tony Monero or, or anything like that? Or Dan, I'm glad that you asked. I'm going to go Travolta. over to... <laughs> okay. Let's see. Tony Monero. We have no horses named Tony Monero. Let's look up Travolta. Oh, we got a lot of horses named Travolta. Oh, I bet. <laughs> uh, interesting. One of them from 1973. One of them from 1972, a pony named Travolta. Oh. So uh, I I suspect that's a not, you know, in honor of uh, the actor. Because when did Welcome Back, Cotter? Was that 75, maybe? Yeah, like I that. think so. So, uh, yeah, but there's, let's see, about 13... Horses named Travolta over the years. Uh huh. The most okay. recent being born in 2015. How many of them are owned by John Travolta? Oh, that I don't know. This doesn't say uh, who owns them. It's only who they're. It's only their lineage. Okay. All right. But I can tell you that the one that was born in 2015. Uh, let's go with. Uh, let's see. Great grandparents. Let's see if we have any fun. Not seeing a lot of fun names in the uh, in the history of this family, but I'm seeing some that date back uh, many, many, many generations. Uh-huh. Let me see. Uh, let me just see what year. I'm just gonna go. Oh, here's one named Vagabond. Vagabond is from 1965, and then I can go back to its very the great, 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 great grandparents. We have great, great grandmother named Polka from 1915. Let's go back even further and let's see about, ooh, that one is a problematic name, but let's go to Reynolds in oh. honor of Reynolds Woodcock. And uh, <laughs> that's from 1873. Yeah, th- these go back really freaking far, dude. <laughs> okay. Wow. Whoever put this together, kudos to them. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so so that's what we got. We got uh, more horses than boats named Saturday Night Fever. Okay. Alrighty then. Well then, perhaps we'll revisit this uh, for our next episode. Shall I? Un- anything else on Saturday Night Fever before I unveil? I don't have anything, but I will say that there are no horses that have the name of... Oh, actually, uh, Dan, this is going to lead into you telling us what the next episode is going to be covering. There are, let's see, seven horses named Lone Ranger. So we have the Lone Rangers. Okay, wow. So, And, and you can pluralize it, apparently. You can pluralize <laughs> it when you're talking about a bunch of horses named Lone Ranger. Yeah, what are we doing, I don't Dan? know. Or... Uh, Three knucklehead rock um wannabe rock stars in the movie Airheads oh, I'm so from 1994, stoked. starring Dude. Academy Award winner Brendan Fraser. Fraser, come on, Fraser, Dan. Fraser, Fraser. I like to put a little z- on it. He doesn't um, want you to, though, so you got to respect that. Okay. Well, I'm just so happy for him. Of course, Steve Buscemi, uh, th- th- the man with, like, God, one of the most incredible filmographies um, uh, in in history. And, of course, frequent Steve Buscemi c- collaborator Adam Sandler. Um, right. Frequent Adam Sandler collaborator, the late Chris Farley, quasi-frequent uh, Ghostbuster Ernie Hudson. Michael McKean, Judd Nelson, uh, Joe Montaigne, frequent um, Brendan Fraser girlfriend, Amy Locaine. That's true. That's true. Yes. Yes. Uh, um, oh, also Harold Ramis. We've got two out of four Ghostbusters Ramis. in this movie. That's true. So, it is It is a, a star-studded cast. It is such a fun movie, Airheads. I'm so excited to talk about it. For anybody who does want to support us, we have a T Public store. We've got some merch. Uh, a link to that and all of our social media and everything is in this episode's description. And um, Dan, I, I'm I'm so glad that we finally got to talk about Saturday Night Fever oh, and man. staying alive. Yeah, uh, it's I, I love doing this. This Worth is so much wait. fun. Worth the yeah. wait. Yeah, and uh, and as you're you're heading out to uh, Manhattan for an audition with Kurtwood Smith, I wish you a good journey. Good journey. <laughs>